This is Cyrus here, and he is an awfully cute little dog, and this is his roadmap to success. Now, uh, in Cyrus's case, uh, I said in the first video that he might have a potential separation anxiety. I don't think it's separation anxiety. The primary issues is he howls when left alone. And uh, from the initial consult with sitting down with the guardians, he really, he's, he's, he lives in two homes, and the daughter and uh, stays with her parents at times. When he's with the daughter, he's with her 24 seven. And so she doesn't have the howling at home because I don't think he's ever alone. I think when he's alone, he's howling, either he wants out of the kennel or he's not used to being alone. When he stays with mom and dad at the place we're at now, um, there, there used to always be somebody here and now occasionally he's home alone. And I think it's his protest or his way of saying, I want more attention. Um, now, part of it might be needing a little bit more exercise. So we can try doing things like taking a doggy daycare for the day and then before we leave. And so that way he's there during the day, we burn off his excess energy when he comes home and then we go out to dinner or whatever it is. I gotta catch up on sleep, man. I've been awake for longer than six hours a day. Most dogs sleep 17 hours a day. So now he's in a position to just be exhausted. He lays down and he's not whining about it or howling in this case. Um, so basically that, the big issue with that I think is, is I don't wanna say a petulance because I wouldn't see him as a spoiled dog, but I think he's used to getting what he wants when he wants. And so I went over a bunch of rules that the guardians can incorporate. Some examples of the rules were not being allowed in the furniture, which for the most part he doesn't. Uh, now he should have the same rules. This is just an empty hand, buddy. This is the good stuff. Um, and he should have the same rules in both locations so it's consistent. Um, basically, uh, one of the rules is no furniture. And then at the end of 30 days or as long as the problem is, uh, as long as the problem is still going on, we would enforce these rules. Once the problems are done, if we want to invite the dog on the couch, it should be with an invitation and only for good behavior. So if he's on the couch and he starts growling or barking, he has to get down off the couch. And again, we're gonna push him or pull him to the edge so he feels like he's gonna fall off and let him jump off the couch on his own. Don't give him an elevator ride or push him completely off. Uh, another rule would be having to sit at the door before he goes in or out. Sitting is a more subordinate position. We're only gonna ask him once. So if I say sit once, he needs to sit. Once he sits, he gets his way. If he didn't sit, I wouldn't keep on asking him. Remember, the more you say a command, the less the dog mean, thinks you mean it. So I tell him to sit at the door once. If he doesn't sit, then I walk away from the, within a couple seconds. I walk away, sit down, and ignore him. After 60 seconds, I give him another opportunity to go back to the door and say, sit, and tell him, don't ask him. If he sits, open that door as soon as the hit, butt hits the ground. If it doesn't sit, though, I walk away for two minutes, next time for four minutes, next time for eight minutes. So each time he doesn't comply, he has to wait twice as long before the human is generous enough to give him another opportunity. Um, let me see, we also went over the petting with a purpose uh, philosophy. So we're gonna ask him, instead of when he demands attention, if we pet him, he's te we're telling him, yes, you're in charge. And that's probably somewhat related to the howling because he's used to telling people what to do and getting his way. So now we're gonna ask him to sit, sit. And then we're gonna pet him and say the word sit. Try to pet him under his chin and try just to say the command word. Don't say good sit or Cyrus sit. Um, also, I noticed the guardians were all using different command words for him. Uh, the word is come, but in one situation it was sigh, and then clapping hands twice, or sigh, 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 or different things. Make a list of the command words, and make sure everybody's using just the same command. If we hear maybe somebody's using come here instead of come, we say vocabulary. The person goes, uh, come. Um, we're also going to use passive training. So every time he does something we like, we're going to pet him and say it. So if he were to sit on his own, I'll manipulate him, sit. So if he sits on his own and I pet him and say the word sit, it starts to associate the action with the reward. Every time he comes to us, we pet him and say come. Every time he lays down, we pet him and say down. When he takes the first bite of his food, we're gonna say feast or whatever the command word is. After a while, now this is passive training, it's slower, it'll take longer, but eventually you say come and he comes running because every time I hear come and I go to the human, I get a reward. Um, let me see, what else? We're gonna use uh, the escalating consequences to disagree with unwanted actions and behaviors. Remember, if you forgot any of these, if you go to doggoneproblems.com, click on dog training tips link. On the left side of the page, there's a search box. You can type in escalating consequences. I'll have a bunch of write-ups where I have a video that's specifically dedicated to explaining what the escalating consequences are. I have those same things for petting with a purpose, for passive training, uh, the door exercise that we saw, uh, saw in one of the videos, as well as teaching the dog to stay. I'd like the humans to start helping him develop self-control. And a great way to do this is teaching him to stay. Up, oh, off, off. If once we get him off the couch, make sure we transition into a positive. We always wanna use positive reinforcement as whatever possible. But if he gets petted for the things that we want him to do and ignored, 
for the things that we don't want to do. After a while, he starts to gravitate towards those th things that we want, which I call desired behaviors, and he does them more and more often. Um, make sure when you're practicing the focus exercise or the leadership exercise, that you are doing these in different locations. If you practice in the same location, the dog starts to get uh, habituated to that particular location. That's why petting with a purpose is so powerful. We do it at a couch, we do it at the dinner table, we do it all over the place. Speaking of the dinner table, we're not gonna feed him any more people food, and we're not gonna let him be within seven feet of any human who's eating. So if mom is eating something here and Cyrus is here, uh, one of the other family members can come get in front of mom and move him away using the third escalating consequence. Uh, so we can help each other out with that. Um, so that'd be another rule, not be within seven feet of anyone who's eating. Um, we establish a line to the door, and we practice that in the door exercise. Um, I would recommend that the guardians practice that at least once a day, but if we, the more we practice, the faster the dog will get it. And eventually, after somewhere between usually six and 12 or 15 times, the dog will just stop and wait at the line and let the human go answer the door on their own. And that way, the human shows the dog, I'm in charge of this. I don't have to worry about, as a dog, I don't have to worry about it. The human's got it under control. Now, if he's at the door barking, and just as somebody's passing by, we're not gonna open the door. We're gonna go insert ourselves between him and the door, put our butt to the door, face the dog, and march at him and move him away from the door. The leadership exercise, we didn't do a video on that, but what I'd like to do is have everybody in the family doing that, and again, this is one where it works a lot more powerfully. Off! Cyrus! Not to burn the energy to make you get down. Um, the leadership exercise, make sure that we're gradually building up the time. So at first, once he laid down, we let him have the treat that was lying in the middle of the floor. But then he's going to have to start waiting for five seconds. And everybody in the fa family makes him do it for five seconds. Then we, he has to wait for 10, then 15, then 15, 30, 45, one minute increments all the way to 15 minutes. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, let's say that this is where the, dog, the treat is, and the dog is over here. And the dog gets up and walks around the treat and goes and lays down over there. As long as he stays away from that three foot zone, he can walk around the room as much as he wants. As soon as he goes towards the tree, we would have to stand up, reassert it, uh, the boundary, and then we would start the clock again. I, my little trick to do the leadership exercise is do it between you, the couch and the TV, so you can sit down and watch TV while you're doing it. The dog goes in your line of sight to get the treat. You can correct him. Um, and always back up a step. So if he can't go from, uh, from one minute to two minutes, go from one minute to one and a half minutes. Same thing with teaching him to stay which I have in this, in this write-up, or I didn't do in this a video for this write-up, but we're gonna do first, first for duration, then for distance, then for distractions. And so if we're going from one minute to two minute for duration, he can't do it, go to one and a half. Um, and practice duration up to five minutes before you go to distance, then move distance away, then we add in distraction. The write-up that is directly below this one on my website has uh, a video where I teach a tit pit bull how to stay. So you might wanna watch that to refresh your memory. You can also just type in the search column, stay, and I'll have a bunch of examples for that. Um, dad gets up early in the morning and dad's been feeding the dog without eating himself. He eats on the run or at work. For dogs, they eat in the order of their rank. So whoever's feeding the dog should eat something first. This is a bully stick, I'm not gonna eat it, but I would take five or more bites of a chip or a cracker. It has to be a solid. It can't be a smoothie or coffee. Dogs don't understand those things. But this way, the human has dominion over the food, they're controlling access to it, and the dog has to watch the human eat first. So that puts the human in more of a leadership position. Um, let me see. Um, I would test out leaving him in, uh, in the house outside the kennel to see, and just do it for a quick, just do it yourself. Recreate like you're leaving. Get in the car and drive two houses down, park on the street, come back and sit in your, outside so he can't see you, and listen. Does he start howling? If he does, how quickly does he start howling? If he starts howling at 10 minutes, then maybe we start practicing we leave, we come back at nine minutes. And we keep on doing that, and after a while, then we do it, and then we, then we go out and we test again, and this time maybe we go to 15 minutes. So we come back at 14 minutes. So we keep on recreating this situation, helping him stopping or come, returning before he has a need to react to it. Um, the focus exercise, uh, same sort of principle. We wanna practice that at least once a day with each of the human. I usually do it with about eight to 12 treats, and at first it's one second, one second. Make sure it's a right angle and make sure when you're, once you turn and you're going towards the dog that you're holding the treat so the dog is looking at the treat while also looking at your face. The idea is to gradually get up to the point where it's one second, one second, then eventually it's one second, 20 seconds. And do that again all, so, all over the place in the house. Um, eventually when you get to the point where you say, where he will focus for 20 seconds and anytime you say focus, he stops what he's doing and looks up at you. Then you wanna start practicing on the walk. So when you're walking, every once in a while, don't stop walking, just walking, and then say, focus, he looks up at you, focus. And do it while you're walking. So that way he gets used to focusing on you 
in a situation where he normally might be reactive. Now, I uh, showed the Guardians how to use a Martingale collar with a special twist of the leash to stop him from pulling and give him more control. Remember the four or five rules for a structured walk. Rule number one, stay in your position, in his case, on the right side. His front shoulder should be aligned with the human's hip. Rule number two, keep your arm relaxed. If you're pulling back, you're putting tension on the leash. There can't be any tension on the leash. Number, rule number three, when you want to correct, it's a quick, you bend your elbow forward in a quick jerking motion and then immediately take the tension off. At first, mom was kind of going like this. So you want to be very fast. We want to take the tension off so quickly that he doesn't have a chance to pull against it. That's why it's got to be really quick. And it's a popping motion. Now, mom and dad, uh, dad and, and uh, the daughter may want to practice a little bit more. Mom has an issue with the shoulder. And so eventually we get to the point, but he did really well with it. And I think with a little practice, he'll stop pulling. Uh, rule number th uh, three, I think, uh, is keep the dog from sniffing, now, or from stopping and sniffing, I should say. To tell a dog can't sniff would be cruel. And it is stimulating for a dog to sniff a lot of things. However, a dog's nose controls 60% of their brain. And if we let them stop and sniff, then they told us what to do on the walk. So as we're walking, if he wants to sniff as we're walking by, that's fine. But if he stops, we just let our arm go limp and keep walking, and the, the leash will get him to come with us. Never pull from behind, only pull up when he's going forward. And remember, he should never be in front of the, uh, his nose should never exceed the front tip of your shoe as you're striding forward. Uh, rule number four is no marking. Guardians laughed when I said he can't mark and can't sniff because that's most of what he does on the walk. But if he marks, he pees a little bit in a lot of places, then he's asserting himself, and that's related to him barking and thinking he's the security guard. Now, once he gets to the point where he's walking pretty good, then we can start giving him some freedoms. After three quarters of the point on the walk, if he's doing well, then we will maybe undo the twist of the leash and then we let him sniff and walk around and have a little bit more freedom because he earned it through good behavior. Now, for peeing on the walk, we're not, we're not gonna let him do it. We're gonna let him pee before we start the walk and at the end of the walk, but not on the walk. Pooping is different. Now, I would also assign, uh, since the guardian lives in a place, uh, primary guardian, where she doesn't have a yard, every time he's peeing, remember, as soon as he starts to pee, we're gonna say Putin, or whatever the word is, in a normal tone of voice, and then have a treat. As soon as he gets done, we're gonna reach down, pop that treat in his mouth, again, try to do it within three seconds, and say the word Putin again. So this way, this associates the command with the action with the reward. Remember, when you're petting or correcting your dog, you have a window of three seconds for the dog to make the connection. So if it's been longer than three seconds, don't get mad that he tore up a pillow because he just knows you're mad. He doesn't know why you're mad. Um, and also try to uh, use the escalating consequence. Try to recreate situations that he breaks the rule or does the wrong behavior. Recreate it so that you can actually control the elements. Instead of actually having a dinner party where you're trying to get him not to eat your guest's food, maybe we have a guest or two come over, we pretend we're doing a dinner party. They're family members or friends, so you don't have to worry about being a guest. And you can help him. He starts to, goes like, ooh, pate. He walks away. So remember, the hiss needs to be before he does the wrong thing. Um, I'm probably forgetting some things, but I want the guardians to know that they can always call me or text me. Now, I travel around the country fixing dog problems, and so if I'm on the road, it's hard for me to sometimes respond to phone calls. Texts are much faster. So shoot me a text and just send me a picture of the dog, and I'll remember and let me know what it is. I don't care if it's six minutes from now or six years from now. I want you to let me know. I can only help you if you let me know. For me, no news for my clients is good news. Um, so make sure you, and don't let it fester. My, a lot of my clients where I need more than one session, it's like 12 or 13, are people who let it go for six months and then called me. It's not bugging me, I'm single, you're not giving me in trouble with a wife or girlfriend, so I want you to call me and take advantage of me. That sounds, well, yeah, that sounds good for me what I need <laughs> at this point. All right, um, uh, where, is he close by? Mm -hmm. Come here, buddy. I need a dog to finish this. Can we come over here, can you sit for us? Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.